Good evening, and welcome to tonight's episode of the Prince Hall Think Tank. Uh, the Prince Hall Think Tank is a monthly show where we talk about various topics related to Prince Hall Masonry. My, my name is Brother Dave Gillarm. I'm, I will be a host until uh, Brother Antonio Caffey shows up. Um, I have the pleasure of being uh, I'm a past master at Mount Pisgah Lodge, uh, number 53 in Columbus, Georgia. And I also have the pleasure of serving as the Worship Grand Historian for the Most Worship Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Georgia, what the Honorable Bruce A. James serves our Most Worship uh, Most Worship Grand Master. I also uh, forgot to mention that our Worship Master from Mount Pisgah, number 53, is the newly elected uh, Brother Chris Caney. Um, he's an outstanding brother. He's going to do some great things. Uh, in addition to those, uh, by and, and for, just for this show, I have the pleasure of being a past high priest, uh, South Griffin Chapter Number Six in uh, Phoenix City, Alabama, where uh, where uh, Brother Carl, a companion Carl Jones, serves as an excellent high priest. And this chapter operates under the uh, most excellent W. H. Mack Grand Chapter Jurisdiction, Alabama, where the Honorable uh, Victor B. Pettis serves as our most excellent Grand High Priest. Um, as always, the views and opinions that are expressed by us tonight in no way reflect the views and opinions of the lodges, uh, grand lodges, chapter or grand chapter that we hold uh, membership in. Um, feel free to post your questions in the Prince Hall Think Tank Facebook group, on our um, Prince Hall Think Tank Instagram page, or on the live chat on that you can find on YouTube. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Brother Brother Morgan, so he can introduce himself. Thank you for that, <laughs> sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is, and Happy New Year, too, by the way. Uh, my name is James R. Morgan III. Uh, I am a past master of Corinthian Lodge number 18 here in the nation's capital of Washington, D.C. Um, I have the pleasure of serving as the Worshipful Grand Historian and Archivist of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia, where the Honorable Quincy G. Gant is presiding as our most worshipful Grand Master. Uh, I am also a companion of the Mount Vernon chapter numero uno, Mount Vernon chapter number one here in the District of Columbia, which operates under the auspices of the most excellent Adolphus P. Hall ch Grand Chapter of the District of Columbia, where uh, most excellent Stephen McKenzie is our most excellent Grand High Priest. And I wanna thank you all for again joining us on the Prince Hall Think Tank to discuss uh, one of my particular uh, favorite uh, bodies in the Masonic family, the Holy Royal Arch. Uh, it, it's, it's very, very important um, information that, that we hope to, to give tonight. And I'm just very happy to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't have the, the, the nice headwear that, uh, that, that, that my good brother, my good companion, uh, uh, Dave has on today, but I do have a red shirt on in, in the spirit of the episode. Uh, and before we get into the rest of the evening, I do want to say um, I want to personally thank um, a lot of our Prince Hall Think Tank um, supporters and whatnot who've reached out to me and, and others here in D.C., uh, whether, they're, whether they're involved in masonry or not, uh, regarding the recent government shutdown. Um, I actually had several people actually reach out to me privately and ask me, was I doing okay? Was I able to get my groceries and all that type of stuff? And, and I wanna thank everybody for their support uh, in that regard. Um, you know, if you, if you wanna, even though the shutdown's over, if you wanna send me money, um, I'll post my email address and my cash app link in the, you know, online and you guys can just keep sending the money regardless. But, uh, but all jokes aside, uh, thank you all so much for your support and uh, I'm happy to be here. All right, thank you for that, uh, Brother Morgan. Um, tonight's show uh, we're go is going to be the first installment of our York Wright series. Uh, we're going to talk about the Prince Hall affiliated Royal Arc, um, and we're going to. Uh, this is probably going to be an intro to Royal Arc. Uh, but I know we got some Royal Arc experts out there, and they're going to go really and um, they go really deep. This one is to kind of get everybody up to speed about what Royal Arc is, what the history looked like, and maybe what why as a master mason it may be important for you to join the um, holy royal art also uh tonight's show is going to be dedicated to two brothers um who are members of the uh, prince hall grand lodge in alabama who just recently passed away and that is uh brother ray and um an officer and brother carter um who both of those just brothers just recently passed away so we just ask everybody keep keep those brothers families 
and loved ones, friends, and uh, the and the parents hall, Grand Lodge, Alabama, in your in your continued prayers. Um, and I know plenty of brothers have seen the post all over Facebook and all over social medias and the outgoing support. But uh, just just want to thank everybody for the for the uh, their, your support and your thoughts and prayers. And just continue to keep those brothers, families in your prayers. They're definitely going to need it. Uh, so to start off, uh, we're going to have uh, Brother Morgan is going to give us kind of intro of, you know, what Royal Ark is um, and a little bit of the history into it. Uh, Brother Morgan. Well thank, well, well, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, before I begin, I also want to want to uh, acknowledge uh, and thank uh, my Grand High Priest Steve McKenzie uh, for naming me as his um, uh, chairman of, of the historical committee of our Grand Chapter, uh, and and I'm definitely looking forward to to, to doing work uh, there as well. And um, and and, I, I'm, and again, I'm not a, I'm not a high priest or past high priest as 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 Brother Gillarm is. I am captain of the host of my Royal Lodge chapter. Uh, I was made a Royal Arch Mason uh, on uh, May the 17th, 2013, um, and and it's been a very, very enlightening experience for me. Uh, one of the things that I was very interested in, as I am with other aspects of Freemasonry, is what's the history of these degrees and what, what's the importance of them. So tonight, we're gonna, I'm going to do something a little different than what you all may normally see from me. I don't have a slide presentation, uh, but I do want to share just some, some important historical uh, information with you all and kind of delve into a little bit about what Royal Arch Masonry kind of means uh, to me. Okay. Um, if we if we look at the history of Freemasonry, one of the things that is very interesting is that the degrees themselves can be very descriptive about what they're trying to convey. But a lot of times the mystery comes in with the origins of what it is that we're talking about. Where did this stuff come from? I mean, we, we know we have these grand lodges and grand chapters and whatnot. Where does this stuff come from? And this can be uh, typified and, and exemplified by the Royal Arch, okay? Um, uh, if you go back and look at uh, Faulkner's Dublin Journal, which was a, uh, I believe a newspaper for January of 1743, we actually find one of the first accounts of what could be the Royal Arch. And I wanna thank uh, my good friend and brother, uh, Dr. Esperin Morris, for sharing this information with me. Uh, that I'm some of this information I'm going to share with you tonight. Uh, it, it, if you look at that newspaper, it actually states, "Quote: uh, Young Hall Lodge Number no. Twenty One of Dublin celebrated St. John's Day, which was December twenty seventh of seventeen forty two, right? Uh, with a parade in which there was, fourthly, the Royal Arch carried by two excellent masons. Fifthly." The master with all of his proper implements, his, ro his rod gilled with gold, his deputy on his left with the square and compasses. Now, if you go back and you, and you look and in and, and, uh, studying some of Dr. Morris's work, what he, what he shows is that we really don't know what they mean by that. Is the Royal Arch an allusion to the Royal Arch degree as we know it today? Is it an allusion to perhaps some deacons? Uh, maybe with rods, and maybe they had a you know some paper mache to 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 display an arch or what have you. Is the royal arch as, as they understood it at that time the same royal arch that we are are talking about, or, or is it something different? Could it be talking about the ark of the covenant? Could it be talking about Noah's ark? We we simply do not know. But the fact is that that language of the holy royal arch, you know, we we begin seeing it uh, as early as 1742. Um, later on, uh, in 1744, uh, we find another account of Royal Arch uh, mentioned where uh, uh, Fifield de Sine, I think I think I'm saying the name right, uh, in in an account of a serious and impartial inquiry. Now, this was talking about uh, the Inquisition's um, efforts to try to uh, expose and possibly decimate Freemasonry over there over in Europe, uh, where uh, Mr. De Sine says that quote, I am informed that in that city, which he's referring to in, of York, the city of York, um, is held an assembly of master masons under the title of Royal Arch Masons, who as their qualifications and, excell and excellencies are superior to others, they receive a larger pay than working masons. Again, we're, we're, see we're starting to see, now there's a differentiation between the Royal Arch and regular master masons, right? 
what that what that difference is is not clearly explained. But again, but he's talking about wages, and and and, and those of us who've taken the royal arts degrees can kind of start to hear certain things uh, that um, that 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 should be familiar to us, right? Um, again, the the royal arts is something that is very important to these men, but we're not getting the illusion of what it is, you know, the, the comparison of what it is today, right? But then something happens in the 1700s. We know that in uh, in the early 1700s, uh, some say 1717 traditionally, uh, more, more recent research is showing a later date, I believe of 1721, but sometime during that period, the original Grand Lodge of England is established, okay? Uh, or the premier Grand Lodge of England, I should say. Now, one of the big differences that happens is, or that comes about is that you also have some Scotch-Irish Masons who come into England as well who want to join and what have you, but they're not allowed to, right? And what they, what they, what they come to say is that, well, this Grand Lodge of England, they're not practicing Masonry the way that we know it to be. They are termed the moderns, right? And so uh, they call them the moderns and they refer to themselves as the ancients, meaning that we are practicing ancient Freemasonry in its purest form and whatnot. And, and so a bit of rivalry begins. As a, uh, an aside, Prince Hall ends up getting his charter for African Lodge 459 from the what's termed the Moderns Grand Lodge, right? Uh, during during this, this period of division of English Freemasonry. One of the big points of contention between these two groups is the status of the Royal Arch as compared to the first three degrees of entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason. The Royal Arch degrees, as we know them today, um, and I probably should have said this first, so I apologize, um, allude to the degrees of Mark Master, the past master's degree, the most excellent master, and the Holy Royal Arch, right? And so you have this bitter rivalry ensuing between these two factions um, over not just politics, not just money, but also the very status and standing of this particular set of degrees, right? And what and what their relationship, if any, should be to the regular Blue Lodge, right? Um, and so uh, something else that occurs later on uh, that, that, that Dr. Moore shows us is that um, by 1752, the, um, the, Royal Arch, the, the Royal Arch degrees are being conferred by the Ancients Grand Lodge, right? Um, which, is, which, which had been established, I think, about a year prior to that. Uh, and so, uh, later on, we see that they're practicing these degrees um, and, excuse me, they're practicing these, these degrees. And as the Royal Arch degrees start to be practiced and, and chapters start appearing, there was another group of Masons in Europe during that time referred to as the Scots Masters or the Scotch Masters Lodges, right? Now, remember earlier I said you had a lot of Scotch-Irish Masons coming into England during that time and whatnot. So while we're not 100% sure about what happened, it is possible that the Royal Arch degrees were brought into Britain or in, into England by the Scotch-Irish Masons, and they were referred to as Scots Masters Lodges, Scots Masters degrees, what have you. What Dr. Morris points out is that it is possible that these Scotch Masters Lodges become known as Holy Royal Arch Chapters because of the military defeat of a man by the name of Bonnie Prince Charlie, uh, who was of the, I believe, of the, the House of Stuart over, over there in England, who was Scottish, who was trying to basically take control of political power and lost. And so during that time, to be Scottish was considered to be uh, like being a traitor, almost like in, in the 1800s in America. If you were trying to say you were for Southern pride or your Confederate after some wars over, you know, you're seen as a traitor, right? Um, and so he, he hypothesizes that it's possible that these first Royal Arch chapters had their roots in these Scotch Mason's Lodges, although we can't be 100% certain. Um, the first documented uh, account of, or, of an actual Royal Arch degree being conferred, believe it or not, happened right down the street from where I live uh, in Fredericksburg, Virginia, uh, not, not too far away, uh, on December the 22nd of 1753, when uh, Daniel Campbell, Robert Hatherson, and Alexander Waldron uh, were, quote, raised to the Royal Arch degree. Okay, notice how I said raised to the Royal Arch degree. Um, so again, we understand that these, these degrees and processes that we go through today have evolved since then. I don't, I, I don't know too many people who say that they're raised to the Royal Arch degree 
in, in this day and time in 2019. Okay. Um, in Prince Hall Freemasonry, uh, Royal Arts degrees begin being practiced, I believe, in Pennsylvania. Um, one of the earliest accounts, I think the earliest account that we have of it, and in, in, um, in Brother Gillan, please correct me if I'm wrong, actually comes from one of the original letters from Peter Manatore of Philadelphia to Prince Hall, where they actually allude to the fact that many of the brothers in Pennsylvania had already taken the Royal Arts degrees, and there's even allusions to other degrees, such as Knights Templars, that we, we associate with the American York Rite. Okay, so we see, so we can see very early, and this is in the 1780s. We can see very early in African American Freemasonry that the Royal Arch also played a role in our development. Okay, uh, here in the District of Columbia, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll end on this. Here in the District of Columbia, uh, the the chapter that I happen to have the honor and privilege of being a member of, uh, Mount Vernon Number no. One, uh, it is stated it, uh, uh, in the best history we have. That uh, that our chapter was established in the year 1850. Uh, several other chapters followed it, from Union Number no. Two, Prince Hall Chapter Number no. Five, and a number of others. Uh, and and so our grand chapter, the Adolphus P. Hall Grand Chapter, was eventually formed here in D.C. And um, and we've been uh, you know seeking that which was lost uh, ever since. Uh, so with that being said, I thank you for your time and your attention. All right. Um... Thank you for that, uh, Brother Morgan. Um, and, all, and all for the viewers, we're gonna go back and forth um, a little bit until um, uh, Brother Kathy and Brother um, Colin show up, and that way we can <laughs> all our presentations uh, usually gel together. Trust, trust, trust me. Our view, our viewers won't won't have any complaints about that. I'm sure. <laughs> all right. Um, I guess I'm gonna go ahead and. And jump into um, uh, my presentation. All right, can you see everything? Okay. Um, we we see you. Well, I see you. I know I see you. And so the presentation is not up yet. No, sir. We just see your shining, smiling face. All right, looks like he's doing something. There you go. All right, so we good to go now? Yes. All right, um, this presentation, I just titled it. Usually I try to come up with something elaborate. Uh, I really couldn't do that at this moment. Um, and I just titled this, um, uh, the Royal Ark. Um, even though I am at, at some point or at some point in this presentation, I'm going to cover a little bit of history. Uh, even though I am a member of uh, South Griffin Chapter Number Six in Fing City, Alabama, um, I'm not going to really talk about uh, Alabama Royal Ark history. I'm going to leave that to uh, Brother Collins, uh, and I'm going to cover a little bit about Georgia and quite a few other states. Um, when I joined Royal Arc in uh, 2007 in uh, St. Andrews chapter uh, number 39 in Columbus, Georgia, um, one thing I was told at that time was to watch a show called The Jewish Jesus. Um, and from there, I would learn a lot of, a lot more, uh, I would learn about Jewish traditions that would help me understand some of the stuff that we do in Royal Arc. And uh, for those that are uh, Royal Arc Masons, uh, you will see that Royal Arc is, deals uh, heavily with uh, Judaism in my point, in my opinion. So uh, understanding stuff like this will help out. Um, and this is just a screenshot. This, they have a website, it's called Discovering Jewish Jesus. Um, and it helps me to understand um, a lot of stuff about Judaism from a rabbi. Um, so this is just one of the tools that you can use. Um, and I'm pretty sure there are several tools, uh, well, online tools or uh, TV shows to help you un help you get a better understanding of the Royal Arc. Um, as far as books go, um, this is one brother. Everybody knows him. Uh, I'm <laughs> I I'll be watching the live chat. Um, 
He's been brought up several times. That's a uh, companion, Damian Jack. Uh, brilliant mind. It's 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 really hard to uh, like, I guess, put this in the words about uh, the his knowledge base, not just on you know Blue House Mason, Royal Art, Cryptic Masonry, Knight Templarism. Um, this is a very knowledgeable brother, and he has two books. Uh, Under the Living Arch and Under the Living Arch Two, um, um, so these books will help help you um, expand your learning about the what Royal Arc is, maybe what the importance of it is to you, and why you need to join Royal Arc. And I saw on the live chat um, uh, one question was if you you know if you didn't if you didn't join Royal Arc, would he be complete as Master Mason? I believe Brother Jack replied that. He would not be complete as a master mason if he didn't jo join Royal Arc, and I will um, agree to that. Um, as a master mason, um, one thing it's, that we learn is you always want to get more information. You always want to learn more. You never stop. If you feel that you have learned everything there is need to, that, that, that there is to have been learned, you need to go ahead and take off your apron, turn it in, because there's nothing else. That masonry can do for you. There's nothing that you can do for it. Um, so if you always search for more information, if you're trying to understand more about masonry, um, I would encourage you to join your nearest uh, Royal Arc chapter. You will learn a lot about Royal Arc, and it will help you understand more stuff about Blue House masonry as well. That's in my opinion. Um, uh, for Damien Jack's books. Uh, you can contact him directly. I'm pretty sure he is tell you how to purchase his books. And also, if you go to the bookpatch.com, you will be able to see his books and you will be able to order them. So if you, I'm just leaving this up for a few more seconds. So if you want to increase your Royal Arc knowledge, uh, what better way than, than to purchase these two books that are written by a Prince Hall Mason? Um, so, um, you have a lot of tools available for you to learn. There are a lot of books out there. You have your ritual. Uh, I believe almost every grand chapter is going to have some type of grand lecture um, um, for their jurisdiction. And I believe Brother Jack also serves as um, the grand scribe for the jurisdiction of North Carolina. I may be wrong, uh, but I thought that was his position at one point was grand scribe. So um, looking for education, looking for knowledge. Get these books. Uh, they will help you expand your Royal Arc knowledge. Um, so now to move on, um, our first Royal Arc chapter in the state of Georgia was established around 1889. It was probably a little bit earlier as Georgia chapter number one by the most excellent grand chapter of the District of Columbia. Um, now I was reading the uh, DC's uh, proceedings. Who, 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 who established it? Was his. <laughs> What's I'm, that? Sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Brother Gum. Who, who established? Uh, there's some place called the District of Columbia. I really okay. don't know where that is. I, I, was I, just I, checking. Heard it exists. I was just checking. I was just checking. <laughs> so, um, so, so what I started to see when we talk about Blue, ha Blue House Masonry, everything comes from Massachusetts, everything is from Boston, African Line 459. Um, but when it comes to Royal Art, DC was very instrumental, in my, in my opinion, of spreading Royal Art masonry uh, amongst African American Masons. So, uh, 1895, DC had extended its jurisdiction into four states. Uh, Georgia had six chapters, Florida had five chapters, North Carolina had two chapters, and West Virginia had a chapter, all operating un under DC. So, uh, 1895, um, uh, DC was saying, you know, we got these chapters in Georgia now, and they're contemplating forming a grand chapter. Uh, it didn't quite happen yet. Um, and in 1903, uh, the grand chapter of Georgia forms. And this was done in Macon, Georgia. And the first grand high priest was um, a most excellent grand high priest, Jesse Robinson of Macon, Georgia. Um, this was a really big thing. Uh, this was in the, it was written up in the paper about Georgia's grand chapter forming. Um, uh, there were several uh, prominent members of our grand lodge who um, became some of his first officers. And you probably seen me on various posts where I uh, posted a, a royal arc apron 
that that belonged to a companion named William H. Spencer. And William A. Spencer died in 1925, and we still and we still had his uh, original Royal Arc apron. So um, one of the things that's that that that's going on when you talk about Royal Arc history, and I'm not going to try to dive into uh, the female bodies too much, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. Um, and this was um, posted quite a while back by uh, my sister uh, from Georgia named Maisha Land. Um, and sister Maisha uh, was explaining something that Saucy Johnson has say, stated. Saucy Johnson served as the second grand worthy patron for Georgia, and he was the first uh, worthy patron in the state of Georgia. And um, he was stating how, how him and William Terry, William Terry served as the first grand worthy patron of Georgia, how they were talking. And they were actually discussing the uh, the, or the widows and orphans home. And if you see me in another Facebook group, I actually posted a picture of that that orphans home that was that we had in Georgia. And they were talking about how, oh, well, where the, the, the orphans home was exactly going to be. Um. And and Saucy Johnson brought up how the Ladies Aid Society, which predated the Order of Eastern Star in Georgia, was very instrumental in helping the lodges acquire property or acquire you know acquire lots so he figured that you know we probably need to get the ladies involved in the establishment of this orphan's home so this is prior to the first eastern star chapter ever being established in georgia so william terry states that we need a, um a court of the harems of jericho we need that in Georgia to be attached to the Grand Lodge and um, to help us with this orphan's home. And Saucy Johnson says, no, nah, we don't need that. Uh, the Heralds of Jericho is mainly attached to the Royal Ark. Um, we need to get the, East, the Order of Eastern Star. So Terry goes back to a Dr. McDuffie, uh, becomes deputized as the Dish Deputy Grand Patron for Georgia under DC and under Thornton Jackson. And then they established the Order of Eastern Star, but it keeps coming up in our Grand Lodge proceedings that um, people want to establish a court of the hands of Jericho and it be attached to the Grand Lodge. And uh, I could be mistaken on this, but I believe in Mississippi and maybe Washington State, um, that the Grand Court Herons of Jericho is attached to the Grand Lodge. Um, I'm just going off the top of my head. I, I believe if it's not that way now, I believe it may have been that way at one point in time. All right, so this is um this graphic kind of shows uh each date where the first uh Royal Arc chapters were established, the first Knight Templar commanders, and the Scottish Rite. So, so as you can see over the years, especially the 19th century. These Royal Art chapters and these Knight Templar commanders were booming. And you probably saw a quote from me earlier uh, from the Grand High Priest of uh, DC, uh, br uh, Brother Dorster, I think I believe I pronounced the name correctly, where he states that men, I mean, that the Royal Art that, that he knew wasn't the same as what was going on then. This is 1895. Now, many of you. As, uh, as companions, you go to your chapter meetings and you see this, it's a couple of you. Um, you have people that, that go through, they get exalted to those degrees and they never come back. Um, and so you kind of still left with the faithful few and it's the even more faithful few than what's in your lodge. So in 1895, the Grand High Priest of DC said the exact same thing, that these men were coming through, getting a Royal Art degree, just so they could be Knight Templars. And they would come to a couple of chapter meetings afterwards, and then you would never see them again. Um, so it almost seems since the beginning, it's always been the faithful few. So I know many of you get discouraged and you want to see your Royal Art chapters build, and you can, you will make that happen. But um, I say, don't get discouraged if it's been the faithful few, because we're talking about over 100 years, and they had the same issues then. But anyway, this gives you an idea of of round of times that 
uh, your royal, your first royal arc chapters and your first night Templar commanders uh, were established in your state. So as you know me, you know I love drama. That's that's what I love to do. I love reading proceedings and I love seeing some drama happen. Um, and I want to give a shout out to Brother Ken Collins for uh, helping me out with this. Um, because the traditional story that we had, that we always had in Georgia, was that our chapters, all of our chapters, were established by DC. Then those chap, then those chapters formed the grand chapter, and that was it. It seemed like it was pretty cut and dry, but we find out that that wasn't the case at all. So, um, we see around 1891, 1890, 1891, um, a petition was received from brothers in Columbus, in Columbus, Georgia, uh, William Terry, William Spencer, Robert Lowe, um, to establish a Royal Arch chapter in the city of Columbus. They petitioned the Grand Chapter of Alabama to start this chapter. Then also, there were um, companions in Albany, Georgia. They also petitioned um, the Grand Chapter of Alabama to start a chapter in Albany, Georgia. This was unheard of. Because as long as I've been a member, as long as I've read things about Royal Arc Matry in Georgia, we've never seen anything stating that any chapter had ever been chartered by Georgia, I mean, by Alabama. And now we have an actual proof that it happened. So the report of the committees on charter dispensations just uh, granted at Celsius Chapter uh, UD in Columbus and Tapas Chapter UD at Albany, Georgia. So now, the drama kicks in. Uh, William Terry at this point uh, was already a past Grand Master of Georgia. So he was originally a member of the Bell chapter, which I believe was located in Montgomery. Historically, his lodge had a connection to Montgomery, Alabama, with brother Horace King, who served as the first Grand Senior Warden, I mean, first Warden, Senior Warden of his lodge, was originally a member was a charter member of a lodge in Montgomery. So they always, they knew uh, there was like a little slight Columbus to Montgomery connection. So the Grand Chapter of Alabama states that, um, that after they had chartered uh, this chapter in, uh, in Columbus, Terry was actually a suspended member of the Ruba Bell chapter. So what Terry does, he goes to Ohio. And why would he go to Ohio of all places? The three men that started his lodge, I think I spoke about this on a previous show, Isham Cooper, Murdoch McLeod, and Horace King all became Masons in Ohio. So his lot also had an Ohio connection, so he knew where to go. So he goes to Ohio, he gets healed into Ohio's grand chapter. Then he turns around and has his whole chapter healed in, um, in Ohio. This caused a big controversy because uh, this chapter still owed um, the Grand Chapter of Alabama some money. And they felt slighted, especially since you had a suspended member uh, going to Ohio and get healed. And they wanted to know why did Ohio do this? Why did Ohio accept them? Um, so, the Grievances and Appeals Committee, they felt slighted about this. They felt, why did Terry, why did Ohio do this? Why did Terry do this? And um, you know, you see here in our opinion, notoriety on the part of certain members of Excelsior chapter, abetted by companion William E. Terry, who we find was suspended for nine payment of dues in Zuba Bell chapter, has caused all the trouble. So all the issues between Alabama and Ohio, they felt was pointed at uh, William E. Terry. So they felt that Ohio should do what's right. You all have W. E. Terry now. Uh, this his chapter still owes money, but so now we're gonna um, make you assume Excelsior Chapter's debt. And so that's what they kind of conclude as uh, Ohio now. Ohio is now gonna have um, Excelsior Chapter's debt, and um. And at that point, me and Kathy, we're still working to see where the rest of the story goes. But that's kind of an overview of um, what I found some of this early history. Uh, 
some of the early Royal Arch history in the state of Georgia, as well as um, when's Royal Arch chat Royal, Royal Arch was established in other states. So that kind of concludes my presentation. So back to you, Brother Morgan. Wow, that, that's that's some some good stuff, man. Uh, I know uh, you know William Terry is one of your uh, particular favorite uh, uh, brothers from history, and I think when I first uh, you and I first started communicating uh, some years ago, uh, I still remember you had William Terry as your Facebook profile picture like forever and a day. I, I remember that. So uh, you know that that sounds like a really interesting story, and I want to thank you for sharing it. Um, I had two uh, kind of questions that came in. I want to. You, you shouted out um, uh, Damian Jack, past past high priest Jack, and uh, he actually had asked if uh, if we would delve into a little bit of the importance. Uh, I want to make sure I'm wording it right, but he he asked that uh, we delve into the importance of what happened in in, in England from from what I had said earlier, and I want to thank him for for asking that because I was going to do so and and, and, and neglected to do it. So uh, so basically, t what happens is that the the war between the ancients and the moderns uh, in England um, spreads across the Atlantic. They, they, put, they start putting lodges all over the darn place. And eventually what happens, and this is important also for us to know in uh, Prince Hall, um, in the Prince Hall family, is that uh, the two grand lodges end up coming together. Uh, and one of the bones of contention, obviously, is again, the Royal Arch. Well, what happens is that they end up um, stating to, to solidify what the uh, what is the foundation of Freemasonry, they state that the uh, in so many words that Freemasonry consists of three degrees and no more that of entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason, with the royal arch inclusive. So, if you, on the one hand, you can look at it and say that the royal arch degrees are separate degrees entirely and what have you, but then on the other hand, and this is uh, something that those of us who are royal arch masons uh, will understand is that the Royal Arch is kind of is is more traditionally viewed as actually being the completion of the first three degrees of Freemasonry. Uh, and this is why to, to go back to what uh, Brother Gillam said earlier about being complete as a Master Mason, um, there there are many who will tell you that if you don't have the Royal Arch degree, then you are not yet completely a Master Mason. And why that is? Well, you know, if you join your lodge and you go in there and then you Going to the Royal Arch chapter, we'll we'll tell you about it, um, and and I think that it's very important to um, that that we recognize that fact. Um, you know, for me, because uh, I was also asked a question, uh, Brother Gillam, and I'll pass over to you about what is the importance of joining the Royal Arch for a Master Mason in the first place. Um, I will speak from my experience, um, the the experience that I had in joining the Royal Arch, um, not just the degrees themselves, but also the way in which my chapter. Um, educated us. Uh, it was very intimate with, with my class uh, in a way that I really had not experienced outside of my lodge. Um, so I cherished that. And the time for me to become a Royal Arch Mason occurred as I was on my way to becoming Worshipful Master of my lodge. I was um, junior warden at the time. And I think in my class, if I recall correctly, I think there were two of us that were on, on our way to, to becoming masters of our lodges. Um, the other one being um, past high priest of my chapter, uh, Ted Ridley, uh, who's a good friend of mine. We served as masters together. Um, for me, at that time, I appreciated the fact that the Royal Arch degree, um, as well as the, you know, the the Mark Master, which that you could we could really could, could do a whole episode just on that degree alone. Um, the past master degree, the most excellent, and the Royal Arch degree. In, in getting each of those degrees, there's a lot of things that are very basic and fundamental to Blue Lodge Freemasonry that um, oftentimes get overlooked. I think. Um, and so the Royal Arch is a place where you can go and really sit with some of the things that you already have learned about, but now let's sit down and really talk about it because you've, you've said these things, you've done these things, but did you sit down and really talk about it and put it in the proper context of the whole narrative of what's being communicated? Um, that's, you know, that, that, that's kind of my spiel on, on the importance of Royal Arch Freemasonry. Uh, Brother Gillarm, do you? You know, you, you're a past high priest, sir. So I'm, I'm going to defer to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you pretty much hit the nail on the head. Um, and for for the audience right now, we're trying to we just um, game plan it right now to tell tell brother Kathy and show that their presentations are instrumental on in what we're going to do tonight, or what we plan on doing tonight. Um, 
So one of the things I, I just saw quickly on the uh, live chat was about uh, recruiting. And I can't speak for a lot of jurisdictions. I don't know about what everybody else allows. But I definitely know in the uh, state of Georgia, we could recruit in the Royal Art because you're recruiting from people that who are already Mason. That's right. Which kind of changes the dynamics a lot. Um, and my profile pit, well, not profile picture, the, uh, the picture I put up in the Prince Hall Think Tank group when I was asking everybody to post your Royal Art pictures was from my first exaltation as uh, excellent high priest in March of 2011. I believe that day we ex uh, exalted 27 to the Royal Art degree. Um, prior to that, it took some time. Cool. Um, what I did was I explained the importance of Royal Arc in my lives and what each Master Mason would get out of it. Uh, then I went to every other, the remaining three lodges in, in Columbus. I did the same thing there. I went to uh, Tarleton, Georgia, and uh, Buena Vista, Georgia, and encouraged them to join Royal Arc. Now, in addition to being the excellent high priest at that time, I was also the worship master of my lodge. Um, then I crossed the river and went to Phoenix City. Um, and since there was no close chapter, um, well, there was no close chapter in the state of Alabama, um, the one in Columbus was the closest to Phoenix City. So I went to the two lodges there and did the same thing. And I went down to Harrisboro, Alabama. And um, by going to all those lodges and explaining the importance of Royal Ark and why each Master Mason, why I felt that each Master Mason would not be complete on this journey unless he went through the Holy Royal Ark, um, these people want to join. So if you're looking for ways to build your chapter and if it's allowed for your jurisdiction, go to those lodges in your area and recruit those Master Masons. They may not join the Royal Ark because they're not, they, well, they probably not join the Royal Arts. They don't know anything about it. They don't see what how it's important to them to join and what the, and what they could possibly get out of it. Um, so we're not asking you know give the secrets or tell all the degrees about Royal Art. But if you tell them, like, you know, as a master mason, this will help you complete your journey and give you some additional knowledge. They may be willing to do it. Um, so I would definitely encourage go on, go talk about Royal Art. Uh, just don't make it one of those. See, maybe it's one of those degrees that you go through so you can go through Royal of Slack Master or Knight Templar and um, and you just put all these stickers on the back of your car. Uh, show them the importance of it and why they need to do this to complete their journey as a Master Mason. Um, I, I, thought, I thought that's what all this stuff was about. I just want to put stickers on the back of my car. I thought was, <laughs> you're telling me that there's actual like information that we have to like learn and stuff that this is a, a this is news. Yeah. So until those little guys go up, would you? I, I say we go ahead and start taking some questions. Well, 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 we're, all, in. Well, well, we're always open to questions from from our uh, wonder, wonderful, wonderful folks. I, I don't know if you see anything on uh, the Facebook or Instagram uh, uh, pages, but uh, but I will say that this this episode of the Prince Hall Think Tank is brought to you by the Lost Empire, Black Freemasonry in the Old West, eighteen sixty seven, nineteen oh six. In stores now. Get your copy today. I'm sorry, shameless plug. I had to, I had to shameless plug my book. I'm sorry. <laughs> we, we, me, me, me and Dave had, had that agreement ahead of time. I was going to shamelessly plug the book at least twice tonight. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Is there a process for leaving PHL and going PHA? I know it's off topic. Uh, well, we had a, have a question about from from Keon Dunham about leaving PHO and joining PHA. Well, I, well, sir, I would say that that's something that if if you are interested in or you know somebody who's interested in doing that, um, I would contact. The uh, the Grand Lodge or whatever state it is that you're that you are remember that you live in um, to to find out more information about that. Um, thank you. Oh, oh, you know, some someone else, Ken, Kenneth Allen. What was what's going on, Brother Allen uh, from Indiana? Actually mentioned uh, York Wright Degree Day uh, in Indiana uh, would increase the York Wright by thirty six members. I think that's great. Actually, that that's a good question um, because I know that in many places York Wright weekends are are are, are being done. Uh, and in some cases, uh, not necessarily all, but in some cases, degrees are actually being conferred um, uh, in one day. Uh, you know, Brother Gillam, do you have a, uh, uh, a a preference? Should you know, if if a brother is given the opportunity to take all four of the World Arts degrees in a day, is there really a difference between doing that and maybe doing it the more traditional way of kind of spreading it out? 
Well, I was one of those guys that went through all four degrees in one day. Um, I would say it's a lot of information. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. Um, um, I will. I would almost compare it to getting your bachelor's degree in one day mm-hmm. and expecting to retain all the information. Um, if a person is allowed to maybe go through one degree, go through the Mark Master degree, then maybe thirty days, six days later, however it may may go, then you go through the rest of the degrees uh, at intervals. That may help you get a deeper understanding, uh, a, get a better grasp of each degree. Mm-hmm. But if it happens where you get all three degree, all four degrees in one in one day, uh, what I would encourage everybody is to you go to your chapters and push, ask for education, because you don't want to go through go through those degrees. Now you go to your chapter meeting and you go through the same thing that you go through in your blue house, where you get some tickets shoved in your face, talk about how we don't really have any money in the Royal Arc. And now uh, you leave back out even more confused than before you came in. So um, try to encourage some type of study session, whether it actually be in your chapter meetings where you can have a lecture during the meeting or you set aside maybe like a Saturday morning, you go get some breakfast or something like that, get some other companions and where you start breaking down each degree. Uh, That way you don't feel like you just lost. That way you just have these emblems uh, you receive a degree, but you know nothing about them. So if you got to go through uh, all four in one day, I would encourage you to try to do your best to push to have some type of education because I think we all could do a better job in our chapters of educating the people that come through on these degrees. Right. And, 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 you know, and I think that's interesting, Dave, because, um, you know, we we have these stereotypes, I think, uh, sometimes we talk about them, sometimes we about people who um, take degrees, whether it's in the lodge or the chapter, what have you, where, you know, even when we get to the to at-site raisings and whatnot, um, where people feel that somebody who gets a degree in one day is not going to be as dedicated as those of us who take them the, the quote-unquote regular way, right? Um, and and it, in, in and of itself, I didn't know that you had taken your raw degrees in one day. doesn't change my opinion of you. Um, don't ask what my opinion is, though. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, you know, but I think it's great that you actually said that because there may be other people out there who have, who took it one day also, or maybe they have the option to, but they're nervous or, or, or feel some type of way about it. Um, you know, I think that's great that you shared that and that you also continue to seek education and, and led your Royal Arts chapter. I think that's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, myself, uh, I didn't even have the option. Uh, I took my degrees uh, in the Royal Arch, the same way in my lodge. We, I took, you know, Mark Master and then I ended up waiting, have, I had to wait like, I think about a month or two before taking the next one, the next one, so on and so forth. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I really appreciate the experience that I had um, with uh, the other companions on that particular journey um, because, you know, we were, you know, we had to be up, you know, bright and early. Uh, one of our past most excellent Grand High Priests, uh, James Gaither, who's a member of my chapter, uh, was our instructor, and we had to be bright and early Saturday mornings. You know, we had to make sure we had our our, our, our books, and you know, we were we were tested. We had to make sure that we uh, we we had to make proficiency and everything. And so it was very um, it was a very nice experience for me because it really was kind of a return to my personal Masonic roots in my lodge, uh, which was something I hadn't really. I I I, I love the Scottish Rite. I'm a past Commander in Chief in, in in that particular uh, body, um, but the experience was different because it was a lot faster and I didn't get the same kind of um, uh, one-on-one instruction that I was receiving in my Royal Arch at that point. Okay. Uh, and so to go back again, to back to the basics and the roots of really what I think uh, the core experience of Freemasonry is with regards to memory work, you know, which is something that isn't, at least in, in my view, my experience here in DC isn't pushed as much in some of the other Masonic bodies as it is in our, lodges right um or at least it wasn't at that time um to go back to the roots of having to memorize a piece of work and learn it understand it um and not just regurgitate it to to say it but to know what it means to embody it uh was something that was very important for me uh and then when i returned to my lodge to um to to continue my work as a uh, as a master mason in, in that body um i think it made me better um i do personally believe 
that, you know, I, I'm not one of those people that, because a lot of folks will say, well, the New York right or the Royal Arch is, is more important than the Scottish right. I'm, I'm not, I don't really get into that argument as much, but I will say this. I do believe that if you are, have ambitions on potentially becoming worshipful master um, of your lodge, I believe that it's incumbent upon you to try to take the Royal Arch degrees uh, you know, ahead of time um, before you even get into that seat. Um, because there's a lot of things that's in there that will really help you, I think, become a better worshipful master. And I, and I do credit more so than my experience in the Scottish Rite, I do credit my having taken the Royal Arch degrees for making me a better worshipful master and a more knowledgeable worshipful master than I might have been had I not done that at that time. Um, and that's something I don't know if everybody uh, has experienced, but those those who have, you know, matter of fact, and and, and Dave, you, you said you were you were worshipful master at the time that you were high priest. So, what do you think that that? Do you agree, disagree with what, with what I just said? What, what's your what's your view on that? Yeah, I do. I, um, I definitely agree with that. It it helped me make it helped make me more knowledgeable. Mm-hmm. Both positions helped each other. Uh, as um. As a worship master and learn and going through Royal Arc, it, it definitely helped help me get a better understanding of everything that was going on the lodge. Mm-hmm. Also, being an excellent high priest and being a worship master, it helped me in that position because now I knew how to operate a chapter and how to and how uh, everything should should run. Mm-hmm. Um, now, one thing that that uh, that does become difficult, and I'm probably explain this a little bit later because uh, my question I was asked alluding to this. Um, for those that know, uh, companion, uh, past our praise, Renza Burton, I'm pretty sure plenty, you all know him from the uh, jurisdiction of Washington. He was present during this time. It takes a lot. It takes a lot of studying, um, to be able to confer those degrees by memory in the same time you in the sitting position in another house and doing that by memory. It's a lot. Um, you, you have to focus, you have to slow down, you have to study or else you're going to start getting lines crossed. And he didn't believe, I guess, he didn't believe what was happening to you saw with his own eyes of me conferring those degrees by memory. Um, so it can definitely be done, but when you see brothers do stuff like that and you and you receive those degrees and now you got all four degrees in one day, so you know, and you all know it's a lot of information. It's, it's a lot. It, it's when you start to get the ritualistic, the historical, uh, the esoteric, and so it's hard to break all this stuff down. And I believe there was a quote about how 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 do you eat an elephant? And I believe the response was one bite at a time. And that's the way you're gonna ret- retain the royal arc. Uh, go one bite at a time. Don't try to learn your mark master, uh, your path, your path master, most excellent master, royal art degree, all in one night. It's not gonna happen. Right. You're gonna get everything confused. Right. Start with one section. Start with the mark master. Start with with the beginning of it. And start understanding what this stuff is, and just go by that one one little degree. You got your rest of your life to learn this stuff, so you don't have to rush yourself and do everything at one night. And so, what that you that you can't memorize everything like Damian Jack. Everybody don't have his brain. I don't have his brain. I can't do it. I know. I don't. Uh, right. What you can be you, and how you learn it is how you learn it. So start taking the one bite at a time, start learning one degree, or at least one portion of one degree. And once you master that, then you go on. And that's how you get this information. That's how you become a Damien Jack or Antoine Lilly or James Morgan or uh, Antonio Caffey. Don't become like Dave Gillian. Like that, that guy messed you did up. You, did you just put me um, in the same category as those fine brothers, man? <laughs> what, how much I owe you? <laughs> <laughs> but that's how you do it. Start off. Uh, one portion at a time, and when you get that one portion, master it, and be and um and start. You'll start getting confidence, and you'll start being able to give lectures in your chapter. And you're gonna become that teacher on royal art. You ain't gotta know everything, but just know the portion that you know. Uh, will be proficient in the portion that you do know. Um, and as far as another question about how long should a person be a master mason before they join royal art? You know, that's kind of all on you. Um, if you say that. Oh, I gotta learn Question the math degree right. first. Right. You gonna spend the rest of your life doing that. There's, you gonna always yeah. learn stuff with the master mason degree. And brother that, Morgan, that, that's, an, that's an interesting question. How, how how long should that 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 is on you? I do believe. I mean, I, I look. I, 
I mean, you know, you can take it or leave it. I mean, I basically uh, joined my consistory. Um, I, the first opportunity I got, I went to the Scottish Rite, and then I ended up um, about a year later, I went to the Shrine, and then the next year I went to the Royal Arch. Um, that worked for, for James Morgan. James Morgan was able to handle that, um, and and I think I, you know, did pretty well um, in terms of what was required of me, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, but that was me, okay? And I was also in line in my lodge. That was me at that particular time in my life. You may not have the freedom at the time. You know, I don't have any children, um, so I didn't have kids to worry about. I just, you know, basically was worrying about me and, and, and the lady in my life or what have you. Um, I was able to handle that, okay? But everybody may not. And then also, too, you have to be real with yourself about where you are with your Masonic, you know, proficiency. I mean, I, I, I passed a lot of exams, but that's because I was, uh, I, I was cheating um, because I was, you know, I, I was, I was looking at the other guy's paper, <laughs> right? Uh, but, but no, no, but, but seriously, um, you have to be serious about, you know, where you are, you know, because one of the things that I think um, the Royal Arch does kind of show in the process, again, at least how we do in D.C. I don't know in other states. Um, if you did not really comprehend or understand or remember what you should know in your lodge, it, it, it does show. Um, at least how, at least in my Vernon chapter number one. Now that doesn't, now don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean that you won't get some help or assistance. But to me, if you're just rushing to get something, I mean, I, I had one, uh, one brother contact me uh, in my, from my jurisdiction from, who, who actually was, was a part of my own lodge, I'll, I'll admit, who told me, he, he asked me about joining my Royal Arts chapter. And I said, well, that sounds great, but you got raised, you came to one meeting, and then we have not seen you since. Why do you want to join the Royal Arch? And he said, well, because I feel that there's more knowledge there, and there's more this and more that. And, and he had all these negative things to say about the Blue Lodge. And I said, well, brother, you haven't been to the Blue Lodge but one time since you've been raised. How can you have all these opinions, right? And I think that what happens is people get this idea that these other Masonic bodies, they have more information, and that's what I really want. So they skip past the basics, the fundamentals, to try to run and get these other degrees. And, and the Royal Arch is not a place where you want to do that because when you go to the Royal Arch, guess what you're going to get? A lot more of the basics. And if you didn't get it the first time, getting it again or getting it in a more complete form, I should say, it, it's not going to help you. It's only going to be more on your shoulders that you're not able to carry it. You got to carry the, carry, carry the load that you were assigned first before you worry about the bigger stone. That, that, that's what I would say. Um, I'm gonna put that on a shirt. <laughs> yeah, I, I I definitely agree with that. Um, and I'm in some places. Um, I guess back, especially back in the days when I went through the shrine, uh, you had to be a Knight Templar or a Sublime Prince. Mm -hmm. So yeah, people that would rush through those degrees just to be so they never have to understand what Royal Arc is, what uh, Royal and Select Master is, what Knight Templar is. They, they Never had any type of basis. Right. They just want right. to get the shrine. Right. Um, right. So that's the problem. It, like I said, it's it's, it's going to be on you, but at least have a good understanding of the basics. Because mm -hmm. uh, if you don't understand, to me, in my opinion, if you don't understand the basics, the very basic in Blue House Masonry, like one plus one is two, you don't understand that, mm -hmm. then you're definitely not going to understand uh, three times three. Right. So, right. um, so take the time to just learn the basics in uh in royal art and i saw another question my good friend uh brother davis out of va uh one of my good friends kate this was way before i even became worship master uh it was, it was fellowship in uh, in columbus then in afghanistan this was my good friend and brother now he's uh in the east or he may be now past master um um but he asked um about why Royal Arc doesn't seem like, why does it seem like it's not such of an importance in certain jurisdictions? Mm -hmm. um, I believe a lot of people that don't really push Royal Arc because it's scary, a lot of information. Mm -hmm. uh, next, go to your chapter meetings. How many people can actually do the stuff that's in the, that's in the ritual uh, for Royal Arc? Each degree, that's a lot, it's hard. But you have a whole lot of confused people. So why do I need to, why do I want you to come in here into this body to see how confused I am? I 
I don't want you to do that. So I'm not going to really push it that hard. That's just my opinion. I could be completely off base, but I see that a lot. It, it, it's scary because it's a lot of information and people really don't want to see that they're confused. So, um, and and then if you join, now I have to, if I bring you in, I got to explain this stuff to you. And how can I explain if I really don't know? So I'm not going to push it, but I'm not going to really, I'm not going to push it away but i'm not gonna really encourage you to come in either so i think that's what happens a lot too brother morgan that, that's an interesting question um you know i think that the real issue is is kind of the culture that we live in um because because we, we understand that our masonic lives are a part of our lives but then we have a broader life context in which we live right and so what happens is when you go into the outside world you know when you mention to people of anything about masonry the first thing, at least in my experience, the first thing I hear people talk about is, oh, my grandfather, my uncle was a 33rd. They was high up there. They was, they was something. But the illusion is to the Scottish right. Everything, you know, in, in the public sphere, people are so concerned about the 33rd degree and whatnot. Occasionally, in my, at least in James Morgan's experience, you know, I may get one or two people say, oh, yeah, my, my, my uh my my relative was a grand master or, or or sometimes you may say that they were a past master or something of that nature but there's very little i think public um acclaim for being a royal arch mason right or, or even anything else in new york right is even worse um and so what happens is that the emphasis that people have the the um the ambition a lot of people have when they come in is how do i get my 33rd degree how do i get my 33rd degree how do i get my 33rd degree and so that's why the Scottish Rite, you know, for, and, and I think there's a couple of other reasons why, but the Scottish Rite is something that a lot of people run to very quickly um, and don't even really get the information that's there because, you know, and, and I guess maybe at a future episode, we can talk about um, how the Royal Arch degree, y you see a lot of the same stuff again, and, and a lot of folks don't even catch that on the Scottish Rite side because there's actually a Royal Arch degree in the Scottish Rite, but, you know, and, and that, that, we, we can talk about that uh, uh, probably at another time. But um, I think the Royal Arch for me, you know, uh, it, with, no, with no disrespect to the Scottish Rite, because because I'll be honest with you, Scottish Rite is one of my first loves. Um, but I think that the Royal Arch is one of those degrees that if you take it and you really get into it, you're really into Royal Arch. That to me shows that 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 that's a Mason's Mason right there to me. OK, no disrespect to the Scottish Rite, the shrine or anything else, but people who are really into Royal Arch Masonry. I find really have a thorough understanding and a thorough appreciation for what Freemasonry at its core is really about. Um, and unfortunately, those those companions are are too few and too far between. But I'm quite sure of out of the 150 viewers that we have uh, live right now, that every single one of them is a Mason's Mason or a sister's sister or what have you. Uh, but we're talking about some other people, though. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would definitely attest to that because I mean, you get a brother that that knows Royal Lark, he's something serious mm -hmm. um, in every jurisdiction because you don't have a whole lot of those that can really educate you on those degrees. Right. Um, and then it's likewise, when you have a sister that can talk about the hands of Jericho um, and really go in depth, she's something serious. Right. right. Um, and for those that wonder why why we're probably not really going to Harris of Jericho, that's because we still hoping, and I believe that there it's gonna happen shortly that there's gonna be a female version of what we do, and we don't want to steal their thunder. Um they got they're gonna have topics that are gonna come up, and this topic is gonna be one of them. They're gonna they're gonna talk about or they're gonna talk about the grand oscillation to the Harris of Jericho versus how it was always assumed as the order used to start. They're gonna go into all this stuff. Um, and if you and if a lot of brothers go into their grand life proceedings, you're probably going to see several mentions to the Herons of Jericho. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was automatic, it's automatically assumed that it's all that's attached to the Royal Ark, and that really hasn't always been the case. But that's don't want to steal anybody's thunder. Mm -hmm. Um, do we have any more questions? Uh, yes, actually, we do from um, from brother DT Green, uh, down in Alabama. Uh, he asked, he, he actually aimed this at me. He says, um, as a Scottish Rite Mason that has yet to venture into the York Rite, what are some differences and similarities between the Royal Arch and the Lodge of Perfection? Uh, that's, I think that's an excellent question and very on, on point, on topic for the night. 
Um, I would say the difference is that the um, the way that it's practiced, again, I'm going off of my experience mm. in, uh, in my particular jurisdiction. Um, the Royal Arch is, um, uh, really the whole York Rite, the pacing is a lot slower. So you get to uh, kind of sit with a lot of the things that are taught there versus in the Scottish Rite. You're getting a lot of the same stuff, believe it or not, from the Royal Arch and the Lodge of Perfection. As a matter of fact, we could have a debate. We could have a debate that the Lodge of Perfection, yeah, you might be getting some other things there in addition to what you're getting in the Royal Arch, in the, the traditional Royal Arch degree. Um, you're getting, they're getting a lot more information and a lot of stuff. But the difference is, the biggest difference to me is really the pacing. Um, and then also something that, that uh, I think does not get talked about enough in Freemasonry, particularly in Prince Hall Freemasonry, is that we have to understand the history of our degrees. Most, I, and I'm pretty sure all of our lodges in Prince Hall uh, affiliation are practicing what's called York Rite degree, degree systems in our, in our blue lodges, right? And I don't want to confuse you between the York Rite of the Royal Arch and Knights Templar and stuff like that. But all of those degrees basically um, from the York Rite, from the, the American York Rite system, okay, which starts at the Blue Lodge level, they all basically were created in the same kind of, um, in the same realm. So uh, what happens is you end up having a lot of folks in America, if they're not very schooled on certain things with Freemasonry, with certain, with certain history, the Royal Arch degrees that you receive in, in the United States and a lot of the Anglo world makes sense to you because it links up with your blue lodge ritual that you already you know are supposed to know the scottish rite that we practice um has its own set of the first second and third degrees which aren't commonly practiced in the united states and i don't know of anywhere today where they're practiced in prince hall freemasonry i know they used to be practiced uh i believe in louisiana and maybe one or two other places but i know louisiana for sure um but they don't even practice it anymore right so what happens is you end up having folks who got a set of degrees and they go into the Scottish Rite and there are certain things that don't make sense, that don't sync up. And that's because the Scottish Rite's historical development is it traces back to continental Europe, to France and, and, and that kind of thing. So what you're seeing between the two and even with some of the, um, not just the ritual, but with some of the uh, accoutrements of the rituals, right? you're seeing the difference between continental Europe and the British Isles. So there, there's, a, there's a cultural difference there as well. And so for those of us who, you know, if you're just in your little small town lodge and now you've gotten your Scottish Rite degrees, they can be confusing if you don't know certain information ahead of time, right? But once you go into your Royal Arch degrees, it, it's, like, it's like clockwork. You know, it's, it's really like clockwork for people to snap into that, in, into formation as Beyonce would say. Uh, so, so that's really kind of the biggest difference, I think, would just be the pacing, uh, to, to sum it all up. Uh, Brother, Brother Gillard, did you have anything to add to that, or? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. I think we can move, go on to another question. Okay, no problem, no problem. Uh, let's see, do we have any more? Uh, I see here. Oh, I want to give a shout out to, um, by the way, to the brothers of, um, Rising Sun Lodge number 46. Uh, this week they, they hosted me. So I want to make sure before I forget to, to give them a shout out. They hosted me for uh, a talk on the book earlier this week. Um, uh, and there was a question about um, um, where we're going to do a show on the Scottish Rite degrees. And I'm going to go with saying yes, it's going to happen yeah. at some point. Um, and I know myself and uh, Ken, we act we, along with uh, the great Martin Honeywell and the dynamic Eric Conahidia. Um, um, brother worlds and quite a few. We, we do it at the United Spring Council, so um, uh, we we go into a lot of stuff. Me and Ken's portion specifically is about uh the history of the uh, uh, Supreme Council. So yes, we're gonna go into those degrees at some point in time. I don't know the dynamics of what that show is gonna look like, but um, we're gonna do it. And there was another one that we're gonna do a show about Scottish Rite versus York Rite. Why not? I don't see a problem with it. Oh man, the, the epic yeah. battle. It, you, like it, it's like I feel like in in America you have a couple of really big like debates. Mm -hmm. Like like we you've got um you know do you like you know the red M M&M and M or the blue M M&M? and M? You know do you like 
Batman or Superman, you know, Scottish right, York right. So it's like one of those, it's one of those type of like epic battles, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think that I think that would be an interesting, uh, interesting thing to 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 discuss. Uh, let's see, any, any other questions? And I guess uh, from my personal views of it, I mean, it's it's really all all of what you want. Um, I see a lot between a lot of mili military jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. uh, York right, it seems like it's pushed heavily. A lot more than Scottish, right? Because mm. um, everybody wants to be between Royal Art and uh, Knight Templar. Everybody wants to be a knight. Uh, everybody wants to go forty miles barefoot over. Uh, uh, yeah, go yeah, go forty miles barefoot of frozen ground. Everybody wants to do that. Everybody wants a little five minutes of fun. Um, so everybody wants to be a certain knight. Um, so and that's coming to those cases. Anybody's wondering, we're, we're, this, we're gonna do a complete York Wright series. This is just a strictly an intro. We're trying to get your feet wet. Uh, when we're gonna come back to Royal Arc again and go a lot more in depth as much as we can. Um, so, uh, Brother Morgan, do you have anything else? Um, yeah, I'm, look, I'm looking here, the, the, the chat is going is actually going off the hook. I wanna thank our, our almost 150 live viewers tonight for tuning in. Um, I see folks from, from my home state of New Jersey. We got California in the house. I see brothers from Florida, and they're they just flying, actually, going in here. Uh, let's see here. Oh, here's a good question. Uh, why doesn't every area have a Royal, royal and Select Masters? Uh, I think that's something we can kind of save. But do you, Dave, do you, would you like to touch on that real quickly? Because we haven't talked about Royal and Select Masters, so what is that, you know? Um, royal and Select Masters, uh, to my knowledge, um, is it's basically like the ending point when it gets to ancient craft masonry. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is more commonly in our culture called the Purple House, uh, but it's uh, the Royal Select Master or Council of Royal Select Masters. Um, this is a series of three degrees: uh, the Royal Master degree, three degree, and this. Um, I believe a lot of in most jurisdictions, it's those degrees are kind of new now because they were always lumped in with the Knight Templar degrees. So now there's being more of a separation between those degrees and you're starting to see those degrees being conferred in a council versus being, you know, just being obligated on those degrees in a commandery. And you're starting to see grand councils form. So, um, so for those that don't know, basically you have your Grand Lodge, which confers your first three degrees, you have your uh, grand chapter, which is your your royal art degrees, or your mark master, path master, most excellent master, and um, uh, royal art degree. Then you have your grand council, which confers your royal royal, uh, royal master degree, the select master degree, and the super excellent master degree. So that's the difference between those two, brother Morgan. Uh, hold on one second. I had to, I'm sorry, I had to put somebody out. Uh, had to escort somebody out to chat. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, we got uh, getting some spam out there. Um, in any case, um, yeah, uh, about the Royal Select. I'm actually not in the Royal Select uh, Masters. I'm not a member of the Purple House as of yet. Um, I actually, I literally have a petition actually right here on, on my desk though. So, so when I get it, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll uh, talk about it and maybe we can have a conversation about my experience at that point. But uh, I literally have a petition right here on the desk to uh, petition one of the councils in D.C. Uh, I'm not going to say which one because I have a feeling that if I do, then it might be a full house that night. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I have the pleasure of serving as a, a, well, I'm, I'm a member of T. Williams Council, numbers, um, number 13, uh, Phoenix City, Alabama. And I also had a, I'm also a past Bright Lustrous Master of that council. Mm -hmm. So have a have a little experience in there in those arches. Right. Uh, I see a question from Randy Taylor. I'm not sure if I'm understanding this correctly, but I think I am. He's asking, um, in predominantly black grand lodges where the York Right body houses aren't worked but are explained within the Knights Templars. So I, I think he's trying to ask, are there are there Grand Lodges where the York Rite isn't being worked in full, but everything's kind of being communicated in the Knights Templars? I don't know 
I've never heard that before. Um, I think he's alluding to what I stated earlier. I, that it kind of it was kind of hard to understand as well. But you do have bodies until recently. Um, with Texas, Texas now has a grand council. They were one of them. Uh, they had a grand chapter and a grand commandery, and those uh, council degrees were essentially being communicated in the uh, commandery, to my understanding. Um, and then, like we have, we have several members who um, are now in that were from Texas that are now in Columbus, excluding our, our my district grandmaster. Um, and so he received those degrees in the commandery. So now, in order to join a council in, in Georgia, he has to be obligated on those degrees. And that that happened quite. Few. Georgia was even there at one point uh, until recently. Um, well, like I say, recent year, probably less than less than twenty years. Mm -hmm. where um, we only had a grand chapter and a grand council and those, oh, sorry, grand chapter and a grand commandery and those council degrees or those um, are being basically communicated in a, in a commandery. Okay, thank, thank, thank you for that. Um, I see channel 144 is asking uh, about race relations in Freemasonry how are Prince Hall brothers treated by the European side? Uh, they say that they're not a Mason and have very limited knowledge and mean no disrespect. Well, you know, I think this is a great uh, question, especially coming from someone who's not a Mason. I think sometimes uh, online, especially in, in, in with the think tank and other things, people think that we just get Masonic folks to, to watch, but we do have non-members maybe who potentially may petition a lodge one day. Um, so we wanna thank you for being here. Um, I would say, you know, to, to, to bring it, to keep it on topic with the World Arts, because we've done episodes on race relations and stuff in the past, and I would encourage you to go back and look at some of the, some of our earlier episodes where we talked about that. But, um, you know, recognition across the color line in the United States uh, is the rule in most states. Um, and uh, the, the, the simple rule for the Royal Arch is that uh, what the Grand Lodges, whatever the relationship is between the Grand Lodges, typically kind of filters up to the upper uh, upper houses of Freemasonry, if you will. Um, I have personally not sat in a non-Prince Hall Royal Arch chapter, although I have been invited to, uh, actually with, with, with some increasing uh, frequency uh, in, in the past few weeks, uh, but I just haven't had the opportunity to just because of my time and, and, and I got other things going on. But uh, but I definitely look forward to doing it um, at some point in the near future to, to observe their degrees and see how their chapters run or what have you. Um, and I, I would be interested to see, um, I think in North Carolina, I, th I think I've seen some photos of uh, of some interactions. So I would be interested to ask, matter of fact, uh, I'll ask the question to the chat. Uh, has anybody here uh, sat in a non-Prince Hall Royal Arts chapter? And what was that experience like for you? I, I, uh, or uh, I'd be interested to, to, to know that. Um, so so please post it in the, in the chat or, or on our uh, other social media platforms. Uh, Brother Gillard? Yeah, I've seen uh, one question. Um, said, can you petition a Royal Arch chapter that's in a different, different jurisdiction than your mother lodge? Um, Good question. Yeah, excellent question. Um, it, it would depend on the jurisdiction. That that specifically is a jurisdictional question. One jurisdiction may require uh, a person to uh, be a member of that particular jurisdiction uh, versus like my area uh, where, where uh, we have a lot of military. Mm -hmm. So their lodge may be in Oklahoma jurisdiction, but now they're a member of uh, a Royal Arc chapter in Columbus, mm -hmm. Georgia. Um, and one of the people that that went through with me went through Royal Arc. His, his Blue Lodge was in Illinois, and he joined um, the York Wright Bodies in uh, Columbus. So I guess it kind of depends on the jurisdiction. You will probably see that more common in uh, military areas because you can't really expect those guys to admit. I mean, I mean they PCS in every two to three years. Now you expect them to admit their lodges and stuff, and uh, they the Blue House maybe one jurisdiction and. and Royal Arc is another jurisdiction, and myself, uh, my Blue House, I'm a member of Mount Pisco Lodge number 53 in Columbus, Georgia, but my Royal Arc uh, membership is in Phoenix City, Alabama. Uh, my Shrine membership is in Phoenix City, Alabama. My Scottish Rite is in Columbus, Georgia. So um, I guess it kind of depends on what your jurisdiction allows, uh, Brother Morgan. Um, yeah, I believe, and don't, don't, quote, don't quote me directly on this, but I'm pretty sure that in this area, um, we, we I know we allow for 
people that have lodges one place, there's consistory another place, Royal Arch another place, what have you. Um, but I believe that there's limits to that. Um, cause I'm thinking of one brother specifically that I know uh, who was a member whose lodge was in Maryland, but he had a lot of other Masonic business here in DC. And he ended up having to move his Blue Lodge membership because he started to want to go up in, a, in a, I think, in, in the Royal Arch or the Knights Templar or something like that. And I think he, there was a rule that he had to move his Lodge membership over, not because he was a member of those bodies, but because he was going into elected positions where he was dealing with money and, and, and other things. So, 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 so those kind of type of things can vary. Um, so I would, you know, as always on the think tank, uh, we, we don't claim to represent the official opinions or, or, or rules of any jurisdiction at all. Um, so, so if you have some, that's a specific question for you. For you, uh, we recommend contacting, of course, you know, the Grand Lodge that you're a member of, or the Grand Chapter you're a member of, or what have you, uh, for for to get the facts that's going to apply to you. Okay, we don't want you telling nobody. The Prince all think tank said because then that don't don't do that. Don't do that because we'll we'll deny we ever know you. We ever heard of you. <laughs> I promise you. Uh, so yeah, um, let's see here. Uh, uh, do we have any other questions? Um, oh, here's, here's, here's a good question that just, that just popped in. Um, is there any religious requirement to be a Royal Arch Mason? Uh, Brother Gillarm just uh, alluded earlier to the fact that, you know, you were watching the show uh, Discovering the Jewish Jesus or what have you. Uh, does that mean that the Royal Arch is only for those of us who are of the Jewish faith or or, or those of us who are practicing Christians? Um, uh, Brother Gillarm, can you, can you explain yourself, please? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I do not know of any religious requirement to join the Royal Arch. I've never seen it in any jurisdiction. I'm not saying it, it's not not out there. Some may require it. I've personally never seen it. Um, I've seen that there are Muslims that are that Royal Arch Masons. Um, I'm I'm Christian. I'm Pentecostal. I'm a Royal Arch Mason. Um, so I have never seen a religious requirement. Uh, that would be that's, that's an excellent question. If anybody knows of one, uh, feel free to post in the live chat or think tank group, uh, Instagram, uh, post about because you could be educating us as well. We all can learn together. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'm I'm not aware of any religious requirements anywhere for the Royal Arts degrees uh, to to be obtained. Um, I, I know that there was uh, brothers of different faiths in 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 my chapter as well as in uh in, in our in our grand chapter so uh, i've never seen it uh, i'm not going to say it's that that's never existed but i've never seen or heard of it in the, in the royal arch degrees at all so uh, I'm, with, I'm with brother gillarm on that one uh for sure um yeah any, any other questions coming in this evening uh wow we're actually at an hour and 20 minutes uh runtime that's amazing yeah and we want to thank believe, everybody for being yeah. on tonight yeah, I don't see any more questions at this moment. And I'm kind of say, I think it's kind of safe to say I don't believe that Brother Kathy and Brother Collins are going to be with us tonight. That, that, that is perfectly fine, you know, because when they, when, they're, when they get on, you know, we'll tell them that we had 150 viewers on just us two, you know. So, 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 so next month, you know, we'll let them, you know, they, they'll do an episode just the two of them, and then we'll see how many they get. We, we have a little competition in house. <laughs> yeah. So, so right. mm -hmm. with that, I believe we can go ahead and begin uh, wrapping up this first installment tonight. Um, so definitely want to thank you all for um, being with us tonight. I know some of the ones thought we were going to go really deep into the esoterics. That's not going to happen just yet. Um, uh, we probably want to look at at least the second, third Royal Arc show before we really get into that portion. Um, this one, the intent was to basically just give you a basic idea of what Royal Arc Masonry is, or what a Royal, what Royal Arc is. Uh, what does it mean when a person is turned a Royal Arc Mason? Um, and maybe just a brief uh, snippet on the uh, on the uh, history. Um, this one we were we were expecting to go into um, Royal Arc history in Pennsylvania and how it's free and everything. Uh, um, but I guess we're going to have to push that to uh, the second installment. Um, we hope that you all enjoyed this tonight's show. Hope it was informative to you. And to me, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from you all, from your comments and everything. Um, and as far as uh, studying material, uh, studying practices, 
uh, just go a little bit at a time and pick up those books by Brother Damian Jack. Go to thebookpatch.com. Uh, once again, that's thebookpatch.com. Go ahead and pick up his Under the Living Arch and Under the Living, Under the Living Arch number two. Um, pick up uh, Brother James Morgan's book. Um, Brother James Morgan, can you tell us about that book again? Uh, I'll be glad to. As a matter of fact, I'm going to share my screen real quick. I got something to show everybody. Uh, hold on, just one, un momento, un momento. Uh, or maybe not. I thought I was going to be able to. Oh, here it is. Uh, let's see here. So this week, um, I am being hosted. Can can you see that? Can, can you see that there? Uh, yep, I saw it. it went over. Okay. Just went. Yep, got it. Okay, good. So this week, I'm being hosted by the Lodge of Research and Education, number two thousand six, uh, un which operates under the auspices of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of New Jersey, my home state. So tell, me, so I'm, I'm telling my mama now, mama, I'm coming home. Uh, so I'm gonna be there. Uh, we have that evening special host is gonna be Brother Cameron Black of Stone Square Lodge number 38, uh, where he's gonna uh, host a discussion. Uh, does the lodge have an obligation to mentor new and young members? Uh, and then after that, uh, I'm gonna be the guest speaker for the evening where I'm gonna be talking about the book, The Lost Empire, Black Freemasonry in the Old West, which again is available now uh, through lulu.com, uh, through Lulu, Lulu Bookstore. And I wanna thank everybody for uh, checking that out and, and those who already purchased your copy, uh, that's gonna be again uh, this, this week coming on uh, Thursday, January 31st at um, uh, the, the Masonic Temple, uh, Integrity Masonic Temple 224 Broadway uh, in Patterson, New Jersey. So I wanna thank everybody. If you if you're, uh, wanna come, uh, it's, it's Master Masons only. It is a tiled uh, lodge uh, event. So, so please um, check that out if you if you're able to come as, as if you're a Mason in good standing uh, and recognized by that jurisdiction. Um, if you are not, but you happen to be in the D.C. area, uh, I have some, one more thing to share with you all. Uh, I'm actually throwing a little shindig of my own. Uh, it's going to be an author talk with me, James Morgan. I'll, I'll be live at the African American Civil War Museum, which is uh, located at 1925. Vermont Avenue Northwest here in DC, right across the street from uh, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of DC. Uh, and, I, and myself and a, a former Prince Hall think tank guest, uh, Brother Tuhu Evans, uh, will basically be doing a live discussion with me about the book and everything. So please check that out. Uh, I will have books on hand to sign uh, and for purchase, uh, but you are also encouraged to purchase a copy ahead of time. Uh, and, and you should see the link there on the screen. So just type that in, get your copy ahead of time uh, if, if you're worried, but you won't be able to. And uh, and I look forward to seeing everybody there. So 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 thank you all again uh, for another successful episode of the uh, of the think tank. Yeah, yes, yeah. uh, definitely appreciate your all support. Um, we got a, we got one comment that said we need a two hour show. Hey, this is you all show. Uh, we're trying to keep that an hour and a half because we don't want to, you know, take up a whole lot of people's time. Um, and we know an hour and a half is long. Um, and we know that some of these topics cannot be covered in an hour and a half. Um, and we've looked at several installments, such as our Young Leaders uh, series. We've had to do several installments because there's, there's so much information that us, us as young Masons, uh, can pass back and forth between each other to help build our lodges. And this Royal Arc is, is one of, we could be talking about Royal Arc till one o'clock in the morning. We can do that easily, uh, but we're not going to waste any or take up anybody's time uh, tonight. But there are times I believe we have done an episode that almost went two hours. Mm -hmm. uh, so once again, this is you all show. We're going to try to give you the best product that we can. Um, and so with that, I guess we're going to uh, yeah, wrap you up. Know what, you they, have any, huh? Did you have any uh, additional um, remarks? Well, well, I would just say, on top of what you just said, I think that they forget, see, a lot of our folks are, are watching this, they're probably uh, sitting in their beds already watching the Think Tank, drinking some hot cocoa or something like that, and, and you you currently are in an undisclosed location, I'm at my usual location in, a, uh, in my home office, and my bed is way across the other side of my house. And and we all have to get up in the work in the morning for work too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so but, but we thank but we appreciate you taking the time out to be with us. We really, we really do. And uh and it's like kind of an inside joke between us because I'm always somewhere. And um 
one minute I may say I'm at home, the next minute I might, now I'll go ahead and put it right now, I'm in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, so um, with my usual avocation, I'm always all, all, all over the place. And uh, next month I'll be back in the uh, wintry state of Alaska. I'm not quite looking forward to that, but yeah, I'm, I'm the one that's usually broadcasts from different places. And the one thing that we've always, that we, that I've received several questions of or inquiries of is how can um, a lodge host a live showing of the Prince Hall think tank? Um, we've talked about that to see what the dynamics are and what most people do not realize is it will probably take an act of God to get all four of us in the, uh, in the same place at the same time. And what our viewers may not know is we all haven't met each other in person. I know that may seem surprising, but me and James Morgan have never seen each other face to face. Uh, we've never seen Antonio Caffey. None of us have met Antonio Caffey. Uh, I've met Ken Collins and James has met Ken, but us, all four of us have, have never been in the same place at the same time. We haven't even been in the same part of the country at the same time. Uh, I, feel like, I, I feel like if, if, if me and Dave, you know, we, we, we tend to like people in Masonic history that were on opposing sides. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we just, it just, for some reason, man, I mean, my, my ancestor was fighting his first worshipful master. It, it's going to be a thing. So for, for, for those of us who are, who are family guy fans, I feel like when me and Dave meet, it's going to be like when, when uh, uh, Peter Griffin always sees that chicken and as soon as they see each other, they have this big epic fight. That's what's going <laughs> to happen when me and Dave get together. Watch, watch what I tell you. Yeah. And when we do meet, we are, we are going to go live. That's the plan. And I believe we have plans to meet probably within the next 30 to 60 days in uh, oh, Philly. Um, so uh, we are going to uh, broadcast that. But I guess to give my part in comments for tonight, just thank you all for your support. Uh, it really means a lot. I mean, be, me being in Midwinter Conference uh, in Georgia and seeing so many brothers walk up to me and they watch the Prince Hall thing and think they love it. Uh, that really means a lot. That's really humbling to know that uh, we're able to uh, help provide education. And we're, we're still learning. We're still young brothers. We just try. Brother Caffey had an idea and we just ran with it. And we just try to do the best that we can. This really means a lot to have a lot of people supporting us. Uh, always thank you for your continued support of the New York Knicks. I know we got a lot of haters out there. Uh, this is our rebuilding year. We take, we, we're doing this on purpose. So I don't want to hear them about all the next all doing all this losing. We're doing this on purpose right now because you know who we're going for, and that's that boy Zion from Duke. Uh, so next and next year we're gonna come back strong. And I don't want to see none of y'all wearing these new. I know y'all haters wearing these Knicks jerseys. So uh, that's my part in comments for tonight, brother Morgan. Go Lakers! We do this all the time. Good just night. let you know. We do behind the scenes as well. I always talk about the Knicks all the time. Go Lakers. <laughs> all right. Good night, uh, everybody. <laughs> yeah. So good night, and we'll see you all next month. All right.